Ecclesiastes chapter number three. Ecclesiastes chapter number three. If you open your, bo- open your Bible in the middle, you can find the book of Psalm. We have the Psalm, Proverbs, and the book of Ecclesiastes. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter number three, look at verse number nineteen. Ecclesiastes chapter number three, verse number nineteen. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse nineteen, for that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. Notice verse number 20. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Now the title of the sermon tonight is called The American Dream. And the, and the subtitle is Prepare to Die. Okay, so the title is American Dream, and the subtitle is Prepare to Die. Now we know that the founding father, their concept of the American Dream is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? And as Christians, we have the freedom to not sin. You know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So if you believe because we are saved, we can never lose our salvation, and you can do whatever you want, and that's total junk. Because the true liberty in Christ means we have the freedom to not sin, okay? Now we have the freedom of religion. Now we have the freedom to pursue whatever we want to pursue. You know, that's a great concept, right? But right now, most Americans are pursuing something else. They're pursuing after their own lust. They're not going after the things of God. So tonight, I'm going to talk about the negative aspect of the American dream. They're going after the worldly lust. They're going after the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, okay? Now, I want you to keep your finger at the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to, going back and forth, but this is the, this is the central book we're going to focus on this evening, okay? But if you don't like uh, what I'm going to talk about, you can go home and eat, eat some apple pies. But the Bible says I'm supposed to preach the whole counsel of God. You know, to preach the word, be in, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with, with all long suffering doctrine. So if you have itching ears, you know, go home, eat some apple pies, and I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. Because we know the American Christianity is lukewarm at its best. You know, I'm Chinese, so I have no problem ripping on American Christians. But the thing is, God says, because you are neither warm nor cold, I'm going to spill thee out of my mouth. You make God sick if you don't become red hot for God. That's why I call every single preaching should be red hot preaching. You now we need to have some preacher who have God who's not afraid to preach the whole counsel of God. You know, all counsel of God, we're not going to shun from some negative parts of the Bible. You know, Think about all the, all the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they are preaching negative. You know, they are preaching something that is convicting people about their sin, and we need that some kind of preaching. You now that's why I'm going to preach about the American dream, prepare to die. Now, first, we know the book of Ecclesiastes is King Solomon, I believe, is at the end of his life, he's reflecting upon his life. He's reflecting upon his life, and Solomon pursued almost everything under the sun. Now, first thing we saw King Solomon pursuing is money. Basically, he's pursuing wealth. Go to chapter number 2, verse number 7. Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, verse number 7. The Bible says, in Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, verse number 7, Solomon said, I got my servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Notice the next phrase. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of the kings and of the provinces. I gave me men singers and women singers and the delight of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sort. So we see King Solomon, he's pursuing after money. He's pursuing after wealth. Keep your finger at this book. Go to First Timothy chapter 6. Go to First Timothy chapter 6. So we see the first thing King Solomon was pursuing is wealth, is money. Now, there's nothing wrong with money. You know, the Bible, God used a lot of people who are pretty wealthy people. You know, think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, Joseph became rich at the end of, end of his age. There's nothing wrong with money. What's wrong is the love of money. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse number 9. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 9. A very famous verse, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 9. 
But they that will be rich means those people who are willing, who desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Notice the next phrase. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So there's nothing wrong with money. What's wrong is the love of money. What's wrong with you desire to be rich? By the way, if you make a decision solely on money, it's a wrong decision. And then we need to put God first. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. So we see the first thing Solomon was pursuing is the love of money. It's the pursuit of wealth, a pursuit of money, you know. And we see that the book of Ecclesiastes is kind of interesting. In one chapter, Solomon was saying he's pursuing money, and in another chapter, he's debunking himself. So Ecclesiastes is like an old man reflecting upon himself. He's debunking himself as he goes. See, at the, at the beginning of Solomon's life, he's pursuing after all the silver and gold and the treasure. But when he reflects upon his pursuit, he realizes in chapter 5, look at verse number 10. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter number 5, verse number 10, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Nor he that loveth abundance with increase, this is also vanity. Why? When goods increase, they are increased, they eat them, and that, when what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes. Notice verse number 12. The sleep of a laboring man is, is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. So what is Solomon saying? If God gives you a job, if you work hard with your own hands, even if you're not wealthy, you are right with God. You know, God commands young men to work with their own hands. You know, if you just labor, work with the sweat of a face, God will going to bless you. Don't pursue after the vain pursuit of money, of wealth, because this is all vanity. Again, there's nothing wrong with money. What's wrong is the love of money. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23. Now let's see a verse that Solomon wrote, okay? I say I'm going to stay in the book of Ecclesiastes, but I may use some other books that Solomon wrote, okay? So, nothing wrong with money. What's wrong with the pursuit, the desire to be rich? Look at Proverbs 23, verse number 5. Proverbs 23, verse number 5. The Bible says, Will thou set thine eyes upon, what is the next phrase, that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. What the Bible is saying? Riches, wealth, tends to disappear. And the Bible says, will you seek that which is not? Which means the money does not belong to you. Money doesn't belong to you, and they have a tendency to disappear. You know, why are you spending your whole life seek something that's not yours? Why are you spending your life seeking something that's going to fly away anyway? So, we see King Solomon is pursuing after money. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 2. Ecclesiastes chapter number 2. So, number 1, we saw a pursuit of wealth, a pursuit of, me- of money. Number 2, we also saw King Solomon pursuit after pleasure, the pursuit of happiness, you know, part of the American dream. The Bible says in, in Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, I say in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Now the word mirth means happiness, means pleasure. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, enjoy the pleasure, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? So we see King Solomon, he not only pursued after money, but he also pursued pleasure, pursued Happiness. Again, nothing wrong with pleasure. <laughs> nothing wrong with the pursuit of happiness. The thing is, we often take pleasure in wrong things. We often take pleasure in sinful things. We always focus on ourselves to be selfish. You know, what can be more selfish than killing your own babies for your convenience sake? You know, what can be more selfish than cheating on your spouse? You know, the Bible says that the murderers shall surely be put to death. Now, what can be more selfish than aborting your own baby for your own convenience sake? So, our society, the American dream, is, is going toward the moral, uh, it's going down and down morally, and sometimes we take pleasure in wrong things. Go, go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. So we see Solomon, he not only pursued after money, but he also pursued after pleasure. And we, 
and throughout the Solomon, King Solomon's life, we know that he, he, he is the, probably one of the most, uh, he's the smartest king um, among the kingdom of Israel. He also had all the wealth, all the possession, but he concludes at the end of his life that all is vanity. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse number 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. And he, God, said unto me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Notice the next verse. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So instead of taking pleasure in sinful things, instead of taking pleasure on the things of yourself, we should take pleasure in serving God. We should take pleasure in suffering for the cause of Christ. The Bible says, and yea, for all that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now we should be glad in it. We shall praise God even if we are suffering reproach, persecution, afflictions, distresses, nakedness, peril, sword. Amen? Now go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. So we see King Solomon, number one, he pursued after money. He pursued after wealth. We also saw King Solomon pursued after pleasure. He's pursuing vanity. He's pursuing happiness. Number three, another thing we, we saw King Solomon pursue is alcohol. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse number 3. The Bible says, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine. Now, wine in the Bible does not always mean an alcoholic beverage. Sometimes it can mean grape juice based on the context, okay? Now, the Bible says, I've, uh, Solomon, he pursued after money. He pursued after pleasure, but he's, but he's not satisfied. And then he goes after alcohol. He goes after drugs, you know, which can be a type of uh, alcohol. Alcohol is drugs, basically. It, it kind of devours your brain cells. But... But let's just show, but let's just see the book that King Solomon wrote. Go to Proverbs chapter number 20. Proverbs chapter number 20. So we see King Solomon, he's pursuing after money. He's pursuing after pleasure, but then he's pursuing after alcohol. And it's really funny, you know, King Solomon did not even abide with his own writing, you know, sometimes. He's debunking himself as he goes. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, look at, look at verse number 1. Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1, the Bible says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You know, go, go to chapter number 23. Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, look at verse number 29. Proverbs 23, verse 29, the Bible says, Who had woe, who had sorrow, who had contentions, who had babblings, who had wounds without cause, who had redness of eyes. These are the symptoms of drinking alcohol. Verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. The Bible says, don't even look upon the, the, these beverages that are fermented, that are alcoholic. Okay. Now, some people think as long as we're not drunk, we are fine. But the Bible says we're not even supposed to look at them. Now, John, John R. Rice, he wrote that, When is a man drunk? When a man has drunk, he is drunk. Anybody who drinks beverage, alcohol, in any degree, is somewhat affected by it. And so he is drunk to that degree. A man can get more drunk than he already is. He can drink until he is drunk, then he can drink until he is more drunk. Then he can drink until he is unconscious and can't drink anymore. A man can drink until a certain percentage of alcohol gets into the blood and stops the motor response so that he quits breathing and dies. Now that is a little more drunk than he was while he was breathing, yet he is drunk. So even if you, you, may, you may have the argument, as long as I don't get drunk, I'm fine. But the problem is, you are drunk to that degree. You are still drunk. And the Bible says we're not even, we're not even supposed to look at it, you know. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 2. Now the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, the Bible describing alcohol as the poison of dragons. 
You know, dragon is another uh, a symbol for Satan. The Bible describing in the book of Deuteronomy that their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons. Because when you're, dry, when you're drinking alcohol, you're basically consuming poison. It can kill you. So we see Solomon, he pursued after money. He pursued after pleasure. And he pursued after alcohol. Now we see number four, Solomon also pursued after entertainment. Look at chapter number two, verse number eight. Ecclesiastes chapter number two, verse number eight. Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse number eight, the Bible says, I gather me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. Notice the next phrase. I gather me men singers and women singers and delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that, sorry, and that of all sorts. So we see, King Solomon pursued after entertainment. Now, some people, they pursue sport. This is the same thing. Entertainment, sport. He's listening to music. He's, he's going after all these uh, musicals, watching plays, you know, Hollywood, Bollywood, whatever that is. So, we see sometimes entertainment and sports that can keep you away from church. And I'm not going to watch a sport while I ought to be in church on Sunday morning. You know, I'm not going to skip church when, when there's a football game going on, we need to give Christ the preeminence. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. All things. You know, don't skip church because you have a, a game. Don't skip church when you are going after some show, when you're watching TV. Because when you ought to give Christ all things. He must have the preeminence. So we see Solomon, he pursued after money. He pursued after pleasure. He pursued alcohol and entertainment. Number five, we saw Solomon pursue after success. He pursued after accomplishment. Go to chapter number one. Ecclesiastes chapter number one. Look at verse number 16. Ecclesiastes chapter number one, verse number 16. The Bible says, I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I'm come to great estate, and I've gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. So we see King Solomon, he is describing himself. I'm so great. I'm come to great estate, and I've gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Go to chapter 2. Go to chapter 2, verse number 4. Chapter 2, verse number 4. The Bible says, in Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, verse number 4, notice the, notice the phrase, I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. I made me pools of water to water there with the woods that bring forth trees. I got me servants and maidens. I got me silvers and gold. So we see Solomon, he pursued after success. He pursued after accomplishment. This is a phrase listed. I made me this. I made me that. Again, nothing wrong with accomplishment. Nothing wrong with success. The thing is, Solomon, he gave his heart to it. He was consumed by it. Go to, chapter, go to verse number 18. It's interesting. We saw that Solomon debunked himself within the same chapter. You know, I'm come the greatest day. Look at how great I am. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me pools of water. But in verse number 18 of chapter 2, Solomon says... Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun. Why? Because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. So you spend your whole life working toward the success, working toward saving up this money, but in the end, you're going to die and leave it unto the man that shall be after you. And what happens? After Solomon dies, the kingdom splits. He didn't get anything. For all his vanity. Verse number 19. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool, yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I have shown myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. So we see King Solomon died, the kingdom split, and you know, these ten tribes would not come back until the end time. We see the consequence of the pursuit of accomplishment, pursued after success, because in the end, you're going to die and leave it unto the man that shall come after you. Now, let me just tell you something about myself. Um, 
I started playing the piano about six years ago when I first came to America, and I had great accomplishment. I, I got the third place in the international competition. But about two years ago, I decided I'm not going to pursue after this anymore. I'm going to dedicate my talent to God. Again, there's nothing wrong with accomplishment, nothing wrong with skills. The thing is, we ought to give our best to serve God. Because all that we do for this world will pass. Only what we do for Christ shall last. The thing is, when you have a right mindset, nothing wrong with money, nothing wrong with pleasure, nothing wrong with accomplishment. The thing is, we should not give our heart to it. We should only give our heart to God because He owns us. He bought us with a price. Let's go back. No, go to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. So we saw Solomon pursue after money, pleasure, alcohol, entertainment, and success. And number six, we saw Solomon, he pursued after relationship. He went after women. 1 Kings chapter 11, look at verse number 1. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittite, or um, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Notice the, the verse number 3, And he has 700 wives, princess, and 300 concubines. Notice the next phrase, And his wives turned away his heart. So we see King Solomon, it's really interesting, because in the book of Proverbs, Solomon warned us about strange women, right? But he himself is fallen into how many hundreds? 300, 700 wives and 300, con 300 concubines. And there's nothing wrong with relationship, nothing wrong with women. In fact, the Bible says, you know, it's a joy to rejoice with the wife of, of thy youth, but the problem is, don't allow your wife to turn away your heart. Don't go after strange women, you know, because... We, we, we don't believe in polygamy, polygamy, and King Solomon, he's, he's allowing strange women to turn away his heart. So what's the problem? Solomon gave us the answer. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. See, there's nothing wrong with money, nothing wrong with relationship. In fact, God wants you to have a godly relationship. The thing is, make sure it's of the Lord. Make sure it's... Putting God first. See, Solomon, he's pursuing after relationship. He has 700 wives and 300 concubines. But at the end of his life, he realized that this also is vanity. What's the problem? Look at verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse number 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. Notice the next phrase. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. No, the ear filled with hearing. What's the problem? We will not be satisfied for, for what we see. Now, what, what does the Bible warn us? The lust of the eyes? Why did Samson fall into um, so many strange women? Because he went to the place and he saw that strange women. He saw Delilah. He saw the Philistine women. The thing is, Solomon gave us the answer. We will never be satisfied by what we see. The thing is, just have some self-discipline you know, the Bible says, I will not set a wicked thing before my eyes, out of sight, out of mind. That's the best principle. See, Solomon, he, he realized that what he sees affects his heart. So the best way is to cut off everything you see. You know, don't, don't watch something you are not to watch. Don't go to some place that you know will give you into temptation. See, the problem of King Solomon is, you know, he... I assume he saw these 700 wives and 300 concubines. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, for, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Go to chapter number 2. Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, verse number 10. Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, verse number 10. The Bible says, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. That's his problem. He's going after everything his eyes is lusting after. The Bible says, I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. See, Solomon is given after his own lust. He's given after his own eyes. You know, he's not having any self-discipline. You know, whatever his eyes sees, whatever his heart desires, he's going after them. So, 
we are to take heed. You know, we are to uh, stay away, be in the world, but not of this world. And so Solomon, he pursued after relationship. Isn't that what Americans do? Is that American young people do? You know, they date around and commit fornication. See, didn't the Bible say flee fornication? Everything that, that a man doeth is without the body, but he that commits fornication is against his body. Doesn't the Bible say that, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glory God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's? See, Solomon, he pursued a relationship, but he realized that the eye is not, is not satisfied with seeing. The thing is, we need to have the right heart. We need to have the right mindset to connect to God. Go to chapter number 5. Chapter number 5. So, not, not only Solomon, he pursued after relationship, but he also violate the key principle of marriage. Go to chapter, number, uh, chapter 5, look at verse number 4. It can be said, chapter number 5, verse number 4, the Bible says, When thou voiced a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools, pay that which thou hast vowed, better is it that thou should, should not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. See, Solomon, he's violating the vow of God, because when you get married, what's the vow? Till death do us depart. So we see Solomon gave us a principle of relationship. He's going after strange women, and he's going after multiple wives, which are not of the Lord. Go to Son of Solomon, chapter number 4. Son of Solomon, chapter number 4. Let's go to a chapter, well, let's go to a book that Solomon wrote. Son of Solomon, chapter number 4. Look at verse number 12. Psalm Solomon chapter number 4, verse number 12, the Bible says, Here's King Solomon describing his spouse. Psalm of Solomon chapter number 4, verse number 12, the Bible says, A garden enclosed is my sister. Again, talking about his spouse, talking about sister in Christ. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. So we see we have a great principle. The Bible describing Solomon describing his spouse as being enclosed, having a fence, having a wall set up. The Bible says, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed, which means your spouse should be private to you. You should have, you should have the possession. No, you should take the ownership. The Bible says you should pr- provide protection and provision. Put a fence around her. No, put a fence around him because marriage is a sacred vow before God. See, Solomon is again violating his own principle. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Look at verse number 25. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, verse 25. The Bible says, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even, even of foolishness and madness, and I find more bitter than death. The woman, isn't that interesting? Whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands, who so pleases God, shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. See, Solomon, at the end of his life, he realized that women, some strange women, they're like a snare. They turn you away from God. See, the Bible says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but the whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. See, King Solomon, he not only pursued after money, not only he pursued after pleasure, he pursued after alcohol, entertainment, success, and relationship, but lastly, he also pursued after education. He pursued after knowledge. Go back to chapter number 1. Chapter number 1. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, look at verse number 12. Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, verse number 12. I, the preacher was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Notice the next phrase. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. Again, nothing wrong with education, nothing wrong with knowledge, but we see Solomon, he gave his heart to all things that are done under heaven. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, I commune with my own heart, saying, Lo, I'm, to come, I'm come to great estate. Look at how, how great I am. And have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. What's wrong with that? I perceive that this 
also is a vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. Again, there's nothing wrong with knowledge, nothing wrong with high learning a skill, nothing wrong with having a career. What's wrong with you are giving your heart? You are being consumed by it. See, I don't like people telling me you have to go to college to serve God. You know, you have to go to college to, uh, to, to learn a skill, to get a job. Again, I'm not, I'm not against people who go to college, but you don't have to. You don't have to. This mentality of people who go to college, they're smarter than other people. You know, most people who graduate college, they're still lazy punk. You know, they don't know how to work. They don't, know how to, they don't have any work ethic. They don't know any skills. Okay, of course, that's not me. But, um, but the thing is, we have to realize that nothing wrong with education. The thing is, we should not have that mindset that it replaced God. You know? So, again, the average college student, they have a debt over $40,000, and the average payoff, rate, uh, payoff time is 20 years. And again, only 20% of the college graduate, they work within their own fields of study. Again, I'm nothing, wrong, not, I'm nothing against people who go to college. What I'm saying is, don't have the mentality is you have to go to college to be smarter than other people. You don't have to go to a cemetery you don't have to go to a seminary to serve God. Amen. So, we see that Solomon, he gave his heart. He was consumed by knowledge. He's consumed by wisdom. He's consumed by education. So, so, if your career, if your job, if your work hinders you to serve God, then you'd better be serving God. If your career hinders you to find the will of God, we ought to choose God first because nothing wrong with skills, nothing wrong with knowledge. The thing is, don't be consumed by it. Don't replace that. Don't replace God with it. Look at chapter number 12. Chapter number 12. See, Solomon debunked himself again in the same book. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, look at verse number 12. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, verse number 12, the Bible says, And further, by these, my son, be admonished, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is awareness of the flesh. You see, if you go after the knowledge, learning, reading books after books after books, there's no end. There's no end. And much study is awareness of the flesh. There's nothing wrong with studying things, nothing wrong with learning certain skills. The thing is, you have to realize that you can't learn everything. Just be content of where God placed you at and do your best, is to work mighty, you know, stand fast in the faith, and, and, and be not weary, for in due sin and you shall reap, if ye faint not. Go back to chapter number 2, let me finish this up. Chapter number 2. So we see Solomon, he's pursuing after money, pleasure, alcohol, entertainment, success, relationship, education. What's wrong when we're pursuing this American dream? You know, what's wrong with not eating this apple pie? What's wrong with replacing the liberty in Christ with your own liberty? What's wrong? Solomon told us. Chapter 2, verse number 14. Chapter 2, verse 14. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness, and I myself perceive also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, as it happened to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart this that this also is vanity. Solomon is telling you, whether you have all the wisdom, whether you have all the money, whether you have all this accomplishment, whether you are seeking after all the career, success, fame, in the end, there's one thing that can happen to the fool, also can happen to the wise. Verse number 16, For there's no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten, and how died the wise man? As the fool. Notice the next phrase. Therefore I hated life. Because the work that is wrong with the song is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So you see, we're all going to die. Whether you have so much money, whether you've advanced in your business, you've been promoted, in the end, we are all going to die. And, and the thing is, Solomon, he's a pretty successful man, isn't it? Pretty wealthy king, pretty smart king, but at the end, he hated his life because he did not serve God with his own heart. He was consumed by the American dream. We are seeking after that, which is not. Go to chapter number three. Chapter number three. 
So we see the concept, we see the theme of we are all going to die throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3, verse 19, this is our text for tonight. Bible says in chapter 3, verse 19, For that which befalleth the Son of Man befalleth beast, even one thing befalleth them, as the one died, so died the other. Yet they have all one breath, so that a, one, a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place, or of the dust, and all turn to dust again. In the end, again, the theme, we are all going to die. What's the problem of pursuing this American dream nowadays. The thing is, we are all going to live under the man that shall be after us. If we don't leave a good inheritance to the next generation, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Go to chapter number 12. I, I'm almost done, don't worry. I'll be on time. Chapter number 12. Look at verse number 7. Chapter 12, verse number 7. Again, the Bible says in chapter 12, verse number 7, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Again, you see the theme in the book. I, I only picked some key verses. There are a lot of verses. And the point is, the problem of pursuing after vanities is, you're going to hate your life when you die. Because we cannot be fulfilled with created things. We can only be fulfilled by the Creator Himself. Go, go, to, go back to chapter number 8. Chapter number 8. So theme number one, we saw the problem of pursuing vanity as we're all going to die. Problem number two, we also saw another theme in this book. Go to chapter 8, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. Notice the next phrase, And the wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. So no matter what you do in your life, no matter what job you have, how much money you make, how many wives you have, you know, how many, how many success, how many trophies you have, there's a time, and there is a judgment. Go to chapter number three. Chapter number three. Look at verse number seventeen. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse number seventeen. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse number seventeen. I say in my heart. God shall judge. Again, that's the same thing. God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there's a time, therefore, for every purpose and for every work. Because people will never be satisfied with these things, they're pursuing these things throughout their whole life. You know, they're going after money. If they're not, they're not happy, they go after a relationship. They're not happy, they're going after success. In the end, there's no end. There's no end with all these things. Blaise Pascal said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. The thing is, even if you are pursuing after all these things, you are going to hate your life. Solomon, the great king, the wisest king, but in the end, he said he hated life because he's going to die as a fool. Go to chapter number 11. Two more passages and we're done, all right? Chapter number 11, three. Um, chapter number 11, look at verse number 9. Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, verse number 9. The Bible says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the day of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine ears. Nothing wrong with rejoicing, right? Nothing wrong with having fun, having pleasure, seeking after some entertainment, watching some sports. Nothing wrong with that. But know thou, notice that phrase, but know thou, that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. See, nothing wrong with rejoicing, nothing wrong with spending time with your family, nothing wrong with talking to people, having great fellowship. But remember this, that for all these things, there's a time, and there's a judgment. Go to chapter number 12. Two more. Chapter number 12, look at verse number 13. We see the famous verse in the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, look at verse number 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into, don't miss this, judgment. With every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So we see theme number one, we're all going to die. Theme number two, whatever you do in your life, there's a time... And there is a judgment. 
One more passage to finish this message up. Go to Ezekiel chapter 6. Ezekiel chapter 6. You have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, and the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 6. So, what do we call these things? Money, pleasure, women, success. What are these things? Idols, right? We're setting up idols, strange God, before the, what, the one true God. See, Ezekiel chapter 6 is the warning of Ezekiel when they are in captivity. The Bible says in chapter 6, verse number 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, talking about Ezekiel, Son of man, set thy face toward the, mount, toward the mountains of Israel, and prophesy against them. And say, in mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, and to the hills, to the rivers, and to the valleys. Behold, I, even I, will bring a sword upon you. Notice the next phrase. And I, God, will destroy you, destroy your high places. Verse 4. And your altars shall be desolate, and your images shall be broken. And I will cast down your slain men, don't miss this, before your idols. Verse 5, And I will lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel, don't miss this, before their idols. And I will scatter your bones around about your idols. So we see another key concept in the Bible. God will make sure you realize that your idols are not going to help you in time of need. And the Bible also tells us that God will always make your idols the object of His wrath. These people are seeking after all these earthly vanities, right? They're going after relationships, money, success, skills. In the end, God is not going to cast you down before these things. See, what's wrong with pursuing after money? You're going to get, get broke. You're going to reap what you sow. God will make sure you realize your idols won't help you in time of need. But let's keep reading. Um, verse number 7. And the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and you shall know... That I am God. I will make sure you get to you make sure you live to regret your decisions. You see, because you love your children so much, don't put them before God. Because God will always make your idols the object of his wrath. You see what I'm coming at? The thing is, because we love the the people in our life, we can't afford to put them before God. Because God will always make make sure you realize that your idols are not going to help you. And he going, he's going to turn your idol, the object of, of his wrath. The thing is, we have to realize that in all things, he shall have the preeminence. Look well, at verse number 8. The Bible says, Yet will I leave a remnant that ye may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations, when ye shall be scattered through the countries, and they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whether they shall be carried that captive. Notice the next phrase, Because I am broken with your whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with their eyes, which go a-whoring after their idols. I want to notice that this is the Lord God speaking. Because, because I am broken with your whorish heart, because these people have go a-whoring after their idols. See, this is a sobering thought. Lord God is talking because we've gone through, we are going after idols. He's broken. He's broken because... We didn't put him first because the Lord God, our God, is a jealous God. He deserved to have our attention. He deserved to have our whole body, you know, as a living sacrifice, to give all ourselves as a burnt offering, to die daily, to serve God. So we see King Solomon, he pursued after money, pleasure, alcohol, entertainment, success, relationship, education, you name it. There are more and more where the American Christians, people all throughout the world are pursuing after. But in the end, you have to realize, we're all going to die. And there's a time, and there is a judgment. I'm going to pray, 